Um, and let me invite, um, before you uh, do give me a clap as well, let me invite Simon uh, back to the stage to talk about uh, advocacy, Simon. Great, well, uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, it was a fascinating discussion about some of the, um, you know, the, the academic context or, or some of the background as to, to how different, um, different social norms and attitudes have developed. And, of course, this is unsurprisingly a theme of our Pride event in Asia, which is you know, the, the diversity of approaches and trying to understand where they've come from and then the implications of that, therefore, for... Uh, what directions we might take uh, in different different countries in the region. Um, I'm really pleased now to be able to uh, welcome up on stage to help us discuss the uh, the issues of uh, corporates advocating, particularly in difficult environments further, uh, Kate Gilmore. Um, Kate is the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, in the Office um, of the, the, the uh, High Commission for Human Rights at the United Nations. Uh, please join me in welcoming Kate. Thanks for joining us today, Kate. Pleasure. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get into discussing this kind of quite thorny issue of if you're a corporate in a, operating in a difficult environment um, for, for LGBT, how you can do that, firstly, to be effective uh, in, in the yeah. environment you're in, uh, and then also being mindful, perhaps, of any, any commercial impact um, that comes. But uh, perhaps if, if we start off, um, I know that the... Uh, that the High Commission for Human Rights has just recently uh, launched its global standards of conduct for LGBTI. Maybe if you could give us an intro to that before we Absolutely. launch into the debate. Thank you so much, Simon. And just to say what an honour it is to be here and to be re rendered so redundant as a contributor. <laughs> Everything I would have to say has already been so beautifully said in regards to Japan, China and India. And uh, it was moving and inspiring. And in fact, the United Nations Code of Conduct for Businesses with regards to LGBTI are an effort to frame up and dist a distillation of exactly what we've heard and to give companies the benefits of hunting in a pack. Meaning, with the companies that are signing on to these standards, there is a sense of community being built to enable companies in even more difficult settings to feel comfortable and confident that they are asking for the bare minimum. And here's the bare minimum. In the first instance, the standards ask companies to be aware that there are international norms and laws. It's as easy as that. That there are norms and laws binding on everybody with regards to how we treat people. With that knowledge, then comes a subset of business. And we're only interested in some companies, actually. Any company that employs people, you're in. And then any additional companies that also provide services to people, you're in. Any company that has customers who are people, you're in. Every other company who don't employ people, don't have a supply chain with people in them and don't have customers as people, you don't have to worry about LGBTI. So we're talking about a subset of commercial effort. If you have people, you have obligations, truly. And there's no fence to sit. <laughs> you either are with law and with normative principles, the essence of which turns 70 this year, born out of the rack and ruin and rancour of the worst that human beings can do to each other. There's this myth that somehow human rights are the impost of the West, an invention of modernity and a luxury of prosperity. Not true, not true, not true. 70 years ago, born of Holocaust and world wars, came this fundamental promise of every member state of the United Nations that born we all are equal in dignity and rights. And from there, there flows now nine international treaties and 
many, many other examples of international jurisprudence taken constitutionally international law. In every market in which you are present, there are laws working in favour of rights and, of course, laws seeking also to undermine. But the obligations of member states, all 193 of them, is to this basic principle. Born, we all are equal in dignity and rights. Nowhere to hide unless you're not working with people. So the standards say, look, with regards to LGBTI, it doesn't say human rights for everybody except same-sex couples. It's not the universal declaration of human rights for, her, for heterosexuality. <laughs> it's inclusive of everybody. So the standards ask you to say, look, don't just know what you do, know what you stand for. Know who you are, not just what you do. So internally, first and foremost, clarify your values. It may be difficult to wave the flag for freedom and equality externally in the business, but you are entitled to establish your own relationship with your staff, and then the standards say with your suppliers, and then the standards say with your customers. And in that, yes, in business, know what you do, but know, importantly, who you are. Do you stand for bigotry or for inclusion? Do you stand for freedom, for everybody, or only for some bodies? And once you've had that values clarification, the standards then say, well, look, wash that through terms and conditions for your, for your staff, wash out discrimination in promotion, because discrimination is a market distorter in regards to talent and merit. It is the enemy of merit-based operations. Wash it out. And then finally, the standards say, look, where you can act. And we know it's tough, but it's possible. Barclays stood up in Uganda and tackled regressive law. A group of companies stood up in North Carolina when the US government, and I must stress right here, let me say that again, the US government sought to ban transgender selection of the bathrooms they would want to use. Just pause and imagine, what is the government doing in our bathrooms? Really? It's a bit scary. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in fan of rights from courtroom to boardroom to classroom to bedroom and bathrooms. I'm not in favour of power and repression in those same spaces. So the action then, we can take inspiration from the companies who resisted and finally, in Singapore, there were a group of banks, JP Morgan and others, who really did say, look, the least we can do is support the Pride March. And then Singapore introduced legislation to say Pride Marches are political. Damn right they are. But I don't think that's what they meant. So, although foreign, they introduced laws that said foreign companies can't support internal domestic politics, as they step back from doing that, under confidence of the leadership and example, 120 local companies came in to replace the financing for pink dots, I think it was called. <laughs> so, clean up ourselves, know who we are, and then find the spaces where you can create so the, opportunities um, for others. The That's what the Code of Conduct's about. So the UN High Commission's made, um, made this code of conduct, and I guess as you say, like all of the UN member states are signed up to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Yep, um, without question. In a sense, there's a bit of a contortion underneath some of this because, you know, uh, certainly many, and we could possibly mm. even say a majority, of the signatory states to the declaration um, are um, uh, hostile uh, you know, to varying degrees, for rights for LGBTI people. So how, as like a, a representative of a, uh, I guess, the, the, the United Nations body that has to, on one hand, um, represent the interests of the member states, um, but at the same time, 
uh, they've sort of signed up for something um, yeah. that maybe they don't really agree with. How do you kind of navigate the, the okay. politics of that? So the first thing is the UN Charter says we the peoples. It doesn't say we the member states. Our first duty is to represent the interests of the peoples, not some of the peoples, but all the peoples, the peeps. We're standing with the peeps, our peeps, every peeps. Rights are for each and every one of us, to the exclusion of none of us, in the interests of all of us. That's our first obligation. So even as a UN agency, you can become unpopular with member states. And we've been speaking about some member states this morning with whom we're very unpopular, but it's not the usual suspects. You know that on the second day of ascending to office, President Trump introduced the so-called gag rule. It's a Mexico City policy by name because it was where it was first introduced under much earlier administrations. That rule seeks to remove all funding pertaining to sexual and reproductive health and rights. As the second, on his second day, under force of that evangelical influence we were just describing in the earlier session. But I guess are, but most of the audience in this room, I mean, I is yeah. making some assumptions that probably wouldn't be supportive of such moves. But so, so I guess, is, is, are you saying that as as a UN, as the UN body, I mean, the way that you deal with you know, hostile no, governments I, is appealing to public no, no, opinion? No, no, no. Law, law, L A W, not L O R E. Law. No, it's quite clear. And you know who made those laws? The same member states. We, I mean, it's not just a white, old white woman with a bad attitude to authority, <laughs> although there is that. <laughs> it is law. It is the Convention Against Torture. It is the Convention on the Elimination of Race-Based Discrimination. It is the Convention on the Elimination of All Discrimination Against Women. It is the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. It's the Convention on Indigenous Peoples. In each and, every uh, each and every convention, there is the right to health. Health is a positive state of mental and phys physical integrity from which no one can be denied, denied simply because of identity. You criminalise action, not identities. And when you criminalise identity, and we've done it on race, let's be very clear, we've done it by gender, to do it also by sexuality is more of the same. That bigotry only ever goes down in history in infamy. We live in shame when we leave bigotry unchecked. This is law. It's not politics. Okay, so let's turn into the application of that, or rather how companies can practically operate. Because yep. I suppose you could say, I mean, Uganda has signed up to the Universal Declaration or, or, or whatnot, but it's still not a great place to be LGBTI. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you are a company in a country with a difficult environment, I mean, yeah. what, are, what are the lessons about how to operate? I mean, one you already mentioned before was to um, you know, sort of seek comfort by herding with, uh, herding with other like-minded firms to avoid yeah. individual censure. That's Do it. you have any other practical steps for, for companies operating in, in harsh countries? Understand the rule of law and use it as a tool for clarity. Resist interference in your workforce. Know that behind bigotry, Come, are, comes uh, close on its heels, violence, hatred, and erosion of the confidence of your workforce. Look after your people. Distinguish yourself from that culture of repression. Mm -hmm. And look for ways to express solidarity. And that's why the uh, example of supporting a, a march in Singapore is so important. But make do talk to governments. You have to do it on a number of legal fronts. You do it with regards to taxation. You do it with regards to trade standards. You do it with regards to health and security. You do it in regards to surveillance. It is an element of the panel P of law that you require to be stable and fairly applied, justly applied, so you can do predictable business. And discrimination of any kind, including of LGBTI, is anti-business. It's anti-business because it's a distortion by destroying basic ideas of merit and of talent and uh, disabling confidence amongst your workforces and your mm -hmm. supply chains and your customers. 
Well, well, I'm sure here in the audience today we've got some, uh, some people who've got experience of uh, doing business in some of these more difficult environments that we've spoken about. So I'll open the floor uh, up to any questions and also um, by the app. Uh, does anybody want to kick off with, uh, with any questions or comments about uh, how businesses can, can operate in such environments? While, uh, while the courage is coming up, I have uh, another question I'd like to ask about the, um, about the standards. So there's, there's always, a, um, I guess, a balance in, in such things between being uh, prescriptive and being suggestive, yep, and, uh, and this comes back to the issue of context. Um, to what extent do you think the, uh, the advocates of, of suggestive rules are just sort of having a bit of a cop-out of saying, well, I'd like to do this, but I just can't in my own, in my own environment. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you hear leaders um, who are accustomed to speaking of their strength let themselves off the hook from having courage. It's called leadership for a reason. It's not followership. It's not chicken out ship. It's called leadership. It doesn't mean that in the tactical game of sustaining business and sufficient market space that you're foolish in that, how you hold the relationships with authority, which is why I started and the standards start with know yourself first. At least know the laws and the international norms that governments with whom you're interacting have obligations to already. They signed on to those obligations freely. No one held a gun to their heads. It are their obligations, their standards. They're not the invention of bureaucrats or UN boffins. Secondly, know yourself. When you don't even know <laughs> what you stand for, what, what is part of your identity, how on earth can you appreciate the distance between how you wish to be and what a government is asking you to do? So at least know what you stand for, know mm -hmm. your own values, and then ensure that inside the business operations and down the supply chain, you are not being complicit with things you don't believe in. And then, I mean, you are the gurus of creating markets. You know how to sniff out a market and create demand. And all human rights are, those things with which we are all inherently born. If we hunger for food, it should be met. We thirst for water, it should be met. And we long for justice. And anyone who's ever tried to put a four-year-old to bed before a six-year-old knows how innate that longing for fairness is. There is a demand inherent in human beings to be treated fairly. That's your market as well. You know how to create and reveal demand and how to engage it. This is playing to your core competency. And civil society and human rights defenders do it all the time. You can do it too. And we need you to do it. Because on the other side of the failure to reveal that demand and engage that market lies great cruelty. It's never been more pressing. Today we have alive more young people than we've ever had before in all of human history. And they are concentrated in the toughest of places, in some of the poorest of communities. 90% of those young people are living today in low and middle income countries. They deserve us on their journey from childhood to adulthood to allow them to emerge into exactly what we did, sexualized, gendered, intimate, desirous, innovative, imaginative, and they are entitled to do that without the shame and the bigotry and the amnesia of adults. I'm sorry, but young people are having sex. Get over it. I'm sorry your mum and dad did it too. A terrible revelation like, today. Likely. Um. So perverse is our relationship to sexual intimacy. Two interesting facts. Do you know there's no data collected on sex between 0 and 15? 
even though puberty has come down by five years over the last 50 years, onset at 10. There's also no data gathered on sex above 49. So if you're approaching 49, <laughs> do get busy Be wherever you can. I mean, make sure it's consensual, but really. <laughs> Interestingly, there's only one age group for whom sexually transmitted infections are going up, the over 49. So perverse, so amnesic is our recollection of what it felt like. <laughs> to not know about our sexuality, to be sexual, to be intimate, that we are abandoning the child as through puberty they emerge into adulthood. And for girls, that's a man-made disaster. For therein lies unwanted pregnancy. The highest rates of sexual violence are against the 10 to 15-year-old. Therein lies a deep betrayal of our children. And with the largest population <laughs> the world has ever seen over the next 15 years, making their way from childhood to adulthood, this business of get real about sexual and reproductive health and rights, including LGBTI, has never been more strategic and never been more important. Well, uh, that's a very good call for action, and I think you've disappointed those who were looking forward to a... Uh, dry um, exposition of the <laughs> UN regulations. Yes, um, but, uh, <laughs> we can maybe try and be a bit more boring this afternoon and uh, less inspirational. Um, thanks very much, no, Kate Gilmore. Thank you. Please join thank me in thanking you. Thank you. Yeah. We, uh, we now move on to um, maybe your favourite part of the day, which is the lunch break. Um, it's at, at the, the market restaurant on level two. We'll, uh, we'll go for an hour. Um, so give a full hour, but in return for giving you a full hour, we're going to ask that you are actually back here at uh, 1.50. So maybe I'll say 1.45, so maybe then you might actually be here by 1.50. Um, so enjoy your lunch, uh, and then please come back here in an hour. Thanks very much. <laughs>